So the presentation that Tom and I are going to give now is based on our reading of the action plan, key elements of it, but also what we gleaned from that meeting um, last week. Um, we're going to rattle through it quite fast. We won't cover everything, but we're trying to just give you the kind of key elements and some initial reactions to it. Um, so over to you, Tom. Thank you. Well, the background to the plan. Um, the Chichester District Council actually quite fast off the blocks uh, and they declared a climate emergency in July 2019, soon after the Extinction Rebellion's April 2019 rebellion. And in that they um, stated that they wanted to see an initial action plan uh, by uh, January 2020, which they published and agreed to. And that uh, initial action plan had uh, one of the uh, objectives was to employ a, ch a climate change officer, which happened in May 2020. So Andrea Smith is the climate change officer. Uh, and she started May 2020 and she immediately started working to, re to revise the draft action plan and come up with the action plan, which is now um, open, for, open for consultation. And that consultation ends on the 6th of November 2020. The action plan has three overall sections. The first section is really a review of the actions from the initial action plan, just to sort of going over them. And, and several of those uh, actions have been uh, pulled forward, some pushed back, and many have been expanded by um, Andrea. Uh, sec the section B of the action plan is really looking at the district council's own operations and how they plan to reduce their emissions um, over the next five years, 2020 to 2025. And section C is the, the targets for the whole area of the district. Uh, so the area wide uh, emissions of uh, carbon emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions rather. And that includes uh, a section on stakeholder and public engagement and how they're going to try and achieve those um, objectives. So now I'm going to go into the uh, first, with well, the section B, because section A uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and that's the, how the, the plan envisages uh, reducing the District Council's own operational uh, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. We should, we should emphasize, of course, that their own emissions is only 0.3% of the total of the uh, district uh, emissions, and so it's very small. But they do intend to do a 10% annual reduction from 2025 to 2020 to 2025, which implies a 47% reduction by um, 2025. But as I point, point out there, it's a big ask because um, fuel emissions from vehicles is 55% of their emissions and including these huge uh, refuse trucks and to be honest the technology really isn't there at the moment to reduce to reduce the emissions from diesel uh, trucks like this and so it's going to be a big ask but it's, i'm really pleased in a way that they are trying to trying to meet that and one of the big things that they are also announcing is that there's going to be a low carbon to fund two hundred fifty thousand pounds which they're hoping to allocate to projects uh, which they are hoping would, real, would yield an income, which they could then reinvest. And so it's going to be a circular fund, hopefully. And OK, so the uh, section C then, the area-wide targets. Uh, and again, uh, they're proposing, or rather they're having a target of a 10% reduction uh, over the year 2020 to 2025. And the council uh, wanted to sort of illustrate what that meant and there is this tool called SCATTER, which, is, which has got this really crazy acronym, Setting City Area Targets and tra Trajectories for Emissions Reduction. This was initially uh, developed for Nottingham City Council to see how they could reduce their emissions. And uh, the Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of the government uh, decided to publish it so all local authorities could, could use it. And it is just a tool, a modeling tool to see how uh, one could achieve uh, the um, local authorities' targets. And in it, um, it focuses on two dates, 2030 and 2050, all beyond the 2025 target that the district are currently interested in. But of course, you have to have a long view in order to, to achieve those uh, uh, earlier targets. And so therefore, it comes up with a pathway about how to achieve um, these, these emission reductions. 
It focuses on six sectors, uh, which are all within a district are quite um, uh, within a district bounds are quite um, easy to ma to look at and understand, and it includes over forty measures. And within each measure, there's typically uh, four ambition levels, where level one is the easiest and sometimes is business as usual, and level four is the most challenging. It has made it very constraining in a way, and it's, uh, it's very lumpy, but it just, it's, a very, it's a very quick tool to understand what, the, the sort of what needs to be done in a broad brush uh, approach. So what I'm going to do now is I'll, I'll have a look at those six sectors. Oh, sorry, I'll start, start here first, of course. Where does Chichester of District Carbon Emissions come from? And I'm focusing on these four areas um, because the uh, agriculture one is actually a negative. Actually, um, the tree planting trees actually reduces carbon emissions. But these are the positive carbon emissions in the district. And as you can see, transport is the biggest um, uh, emitter of carbon in the, in the district. But the, so if we put the uh, go into scatter, this is what scatter comes up with. And so it's, it's, it's uh, projecting, projecting from uh, 20, 20, 2018 to 2050 um, various um, carbon emissions. And as you can see, the biggest reduction is in transport. And this is just, as I say, this is just a modeling tool. This is not what the District Council are advocating. It's just to help uh, illustrate how to achieve their five year target. And uh, so therefore you have the, all the four sectors and agriculture, like I say, is negative below the axis. And the green line is the sum of all the emissions, including agriculture. So it's showing you by 2050, there's still a residual uh, 25 and a half thousand tons of carbon emissions. But so if we look at transport, um, there's various aspects are proposed by the model. And uh, the ones that I'd like to pull out as being particularly uh, interesting is it's actually proposed in the model reducing passenger distance uh, per person by 25 percent but also a modal shift so at the moment uh, 74 percent of uh, passenger miles are done in a car van or on a motorbike uh, whereas they're proposed in the model it was proposing reducing that to 38 percent so together there are really significant changes in in behavior and as far as domestic and industry concerned i'll put them together because they're essentially they are the same and but again the model uh, sort of to, to achieve its target is advocating a deep fabric retrofit of existing stock and what it's saying is that it should be 10 percent of the um, properties that are currently exist because of course by 2050 80 percent of uh, properties Will already be have already been built now, and so what they're saying is that uh, ten percent of properties that are built now should be reduced to a medium level, which is um, uh, sort of a half of a currently in a half of current energy consumption, but eighty percent needs to have a deep retrofit to actually twenty five percent of what we're currently using uh, in our properties, which is a huge huge target, and and I was also advocating in the model that all new builds are to a passive house standard and lighting and appliance efficiencies are increasing as they have done uh, over many years. The other side of the coin, of course, is the energy supply. And what is, uh, the model is advocating is that all gas boilers um, are replaced uh, with low carbon alternatives. And this is an example of an air source heat pump. And that all new build um, is going to be off the grid, off the gas grid. So the, the government have policy that by 2025, uh, no new properties will be connected to the gas grid. And of course, a, a small measure is uh, moving our gas cooking to electric. And waste reduction is, a, is quite a small aspect as far as uh, carbon emissions are concerned, but uh, it's reducing the overall waste volume and increasing the amount of recycling. And agriculture and land use. Uh, one of the things that the model proposes is that um, the land area of the Chichester district uh, is in the, of trees is increased by 30% um, by 2030. And you may know that Chichester district is actually one of the most wooded districts in the country already. So that's quite a significant change. 
and and livestock um, they uh, in the model advocates uh, zero point two percent reduction in livestock every year. And then energy supply. Uh, this is slightly separate because everything else up to now has been in uh, consumption or emissions of carbon. And this is how to supply the new energy um, uh, scenario, which is going to be much more electrified. And so therefore we need more PV on the roofs and land, more wind turbines on shore, uh, increasing uh, biomass and also increasing offshore wind. And um, in the uh, scatter model, they um, take the national figure of what's required to, to meet our energy needs. And then it divvies up the renewable uh, energy generation based on land area. It's very crude, but it gives you a, a rough idea of what um, is needed. And so if we look in more in closely at what's required within the Chisa district, it comes up with this. So I'm just looking at 2030. And so, as you can see, uh, most of the energy in the model is going to come from offshore um, and then some onshore and small scale wind and solar PV. And if you look at it on the right there, what it's saying is that for an offshore wind, it's going to be a quarter of the size of the current Rampion wind uh, farm that's off the sh uh, coast of Brighton. Onshore, 27 uh, large wind turbines and then uh, 11,000 small wind turbines and 2,000 medium-sized wind turbines. Uh, I think, to be honest, that's not right because I think it's far easier to have many more um, onshore large wind turbines than many small ones, personally. And also, as far as uh, solar PV is concerned, the model's proposing three uh, solar farms the size of Tangmere, where in the Chichester district, we already have 12 solar farms the size of Tangmere. So it's just showing you how it's just divvying up the national figure rather than looking at locally. And it's also proposing that 28,000 homes have large uh, solar panels on them. And again, that's, we go about 54,000 uh, homes in the Chichester district. 28,000, I think, is far larger. But what this is saying is that from um, renewable sources, 23% of our current fuel consumption will be met from renewable sources by 2030. And of course, by 2030, our energy consumption will have reduced as well. And the final point is to, to think about is the scatter tool, is the scatter model enough? And um, the, the action plan actually uh, alludes to another uh, um, modeling tool, which has been developed by the Tyndall Center at the University of Manchester. And what they've done is they've taken the IPCC uh, targets from uh, December 2018 and divvied up the targets to all the local authorities within the UK. And what it's saying that between 2018 and 2049, the carbon budget, carbon dioxide budget for the Chittas district is 6.2 megatons, but the scatter model is 11.2. So it's almost twice as, as, as much as what the Tyndall model is saying we, we should be keeping under. So all those measures I went through, which are really hard, is still not enough. And in fact, the Tyndall model advocates that um, there should be a 14% reduction per year over those um, 32 years, rather than 10% of the next five that the District Council is proposing. There we go. And I just thought I'd point out the largest uh, carbon dioxide emissions point sources within the district. The largest one, actually, is the Singleton Oil Well, which is 3% of the district's emissions, or 10 times the district council's emissions. And so that's a significant uh, point source of carbon, which obviously would be rather nice if we got rid of. Over to you, Lucia. Great, thanks. So I'm... Um, focusing on the district-wide um, emissions and how the, those reductions are achieved, that 10% year-on-year that Tom was talking about, and the examples he gave of, of the different the six different sectors, which are examples and not plans. Uh, they're not, not council commitments. But what's being proposed um, in terms of... Um, Um, of, of how these 
this broad target of 10% year on year is achieved, according to the plan, um, there to, it's to be achieved through three main approaches. And that's through the establishment of working groups, through a behavior change campaign um, and dialogue, which is in inverted comments, commas, and I'll explain why later, and through a citizen's jury. So these are all public and stakeholder engagement approaches, which are um, the way in which the council is proposing that this, these district-wide targets are going to be reached. So I'm just gonna pick up those elements in a bit more detail, starting with the working groups. Um, so if I'm absolutely honest, I don't really understand what's being proposed or how they'll work, but this is what, as much as I, oh, we understand from the plan and from also the, the questions we asked and answer we, answers we received last week in our meeting with the council. So there's two elements to the working groups element. The first is that the climate change officer will identify groups that are already engaged in greenhouse gas reduction projects, which the council will support. It doesn't say at this stage which groups, what the selection criteria will be, or how impact will be monitored. Um, but that, that's one element of the support that the council will give to groups already working on um, carbon reduction projects. But in addition to that, there's a proposal to set up working groups on selected themes. And the themes that are being proposed at the moment, but I think none of this is set in stone. I mean, this plan is iterative and, um, you know, it will develop as it goes, but the, the immediate working groups that have been identified are for transport, for tree planting, and after some lobbying by Tom, a working group on renewable energy. These groups will be open to um, all with an interest or a stake on the particular issue including businesses, public sector, so health and education, third sector groups, so civil society, NGOs, local folk food co-ops, environmental and social justice groups, other local authorities, um, so county, parish or neighbouring councils, and to organisations representing a particular demographic, so for example, youth or people with mobility issues. Um, According to the plan, they'll be set up by the, by the council, but it's intended that they will become self-sustainable. It's not quite clear what the working groups will do, what, what their remit is. Um, the council has told us, or the council officers have told us, they're drafting TORs for them at the moment. So, you know, some of that thinking is going on, we just don't know it. Um, but the plan doesn't elaborate on how these working groups are intended to contribute to the necessary carbon reductions. So for example, do they take the lead on developing strategies and plans on the issue? And if so, how would those strategies and plans be integrated into council thinking and decision making? What's the mechanism for coordination between these groups? How will their progress and impact be monitored and assessed? and how will their sustainability be ensured? And of course, who are they accountable to? Um, there was a suggestion in last week's meeting that the coordination oversight role uh, might rest with the council's environment panel, but it's not clear that that has the capacity or the expertise for such a role. So moving on to beha the behavior change campaign and dialogue. So this element of the plan is all about public engagement to encourage low carbon lifestyles. So what's laid out in the plan are several different elements, proposals about what might be done. Um, this includes um, some sort of climate change pledge for people to sign up to. This has been done by West Sussex County Council. I'm not sure how successful it was there. Um, a public campaign designed by the council's communication division, but not until spring 2021 at the earliest. Um, the plan says this would involve promoting existing initiatives such as Warmer Sussex and Solar Together, which some of you might already know about, asking groups such as um, Eco Chai, Transition Chichester, XR, us, um, to help out um, with this campaign, 
using social media platforms to push messages out and promoting phone apps to allow people to measure their carbon footprint. Um, we can go back to this, but I think what is really missing from the plan, at least, is, is the dialogue element of this. And I'll speak to it a bit um, just towards the end of the presentation. Um, the final element of the public stakeholder engagement plan is um, a citizen's jury, again, proposed for some time in 2021. And that is actually real progress. The initial action plan didn't have this in it. And I think uh, XR could potentially take some credit for it because um, climate assemblies, rather than just citizens jur juries, but they are in broadly the same sort of idea, um, is a key demand of, of XR and one that we've been campaigning a lot nationally and locally. So the way the plan um, is proposing um, a citizen's jury is that it would be composed of 12 or more randomly selected but demographically representative members of the public who would spend two to three days being given expert evidence and formulating recommendations. However, um, it was encouraging actually in last week's meeting with the council that the officer indicated that there was a plan to employ an NGO to assist in setting up and running that jury and that the council would be open to guidance on not the numbers needed so that, that 12 is not fixed in stone. Um, not everybody here might be familiar with citizens assemblies. Um, we basically they're, they're mechanisms, processes by which citizens are brought together to deliberate on an issue um, and make recommendations to relevant authorities about what needs to be done. Um, we have a presentation on those which we can um, provide a link to, but it's also worth looking at the UK Parliament's um, Citizens Assembly link um, because they've just run one and it's incredibly inspiring and, and thought provoking. So back to you, Tom, for our initial response to the plan. Yes. Um... Yeah, there are, it's, it's quite good in many respects in that it does address the district council's own operations and district wide. Some local authorities have, have really focused on their own operations. And if, it, if like I showed, uh, the district council's own operations is a very small part of the mix in the district. The target of 10% per annum is not insignificant. Um, at the moment, I think we're running at about 2 to 3% reductions per annum. And that's mainly because of the decarbonisation of the electricity grid. And at least it refers to the Tyndall target and it is referenced. So therefore, it is, it is sort of putting its hands up to say, look, this is not the only uh, target that we should be focused on. The, the plan is quite comprehensive and addresses most of the key issues and sectors that uh, are within the remit of the district to focus on. And there is a definitely a recognition that uh, stakeholder and public engagement is necessary in order to achieve anything like what's needed to, uh, to reduce our carbon emissions by 2050. But, but, and apologies, um, Chris, and this is where I get, we get a bit sort of, a uh, bit negative. There are positive things about it and we, we really think it's workable with and you know there are you know it's a start um and you know something really worth engaging with but i think what partly what comes across is it and what came across i think very strongly in last week's meeting was it's a real business as usual approach there's no real sense of urgency no obvious vision and no sense that the council has really recognized that it's taking on a leadership role and I think if you compare and contrast that with the council and other authorities' response to COVID-19, it's very, very different. There's, there's not the same sense of emergency and crisis, even though um, it clearly is one. As Tom says, the 10% target is, is ambitious, but ultimately it won't be enough. I think we don't need to get terribly hang up, hung up on the target at this stage, but it's just to sort of stress that this, you know, there's something much bigger out there that we're going to need to do. Um, I think a major concern is us for us is that the engagement plans may or they may not achieve the district-wide carbon um, 
reduction targets. They're unjoined up, uncoordinated, and not obviously mutually reinforcing, and they don't really set out a pathway to change. I think what's missing is the, is the strategy here. We recognise the council doesn't have control over the district-wide um, um, emissions, but there does need to be a kind of clear strategy, a coherent strategy about how, um, how the engagement plans will contribute to, to the reductions. So specifically, I mean, the working groups are, appear quite ad hoc and unrelated to one another. Um, quite, as far as we understand, and they're not accountable and they're possibly not sustainable. The behaviour change plans are really limited. They're primarily web and phone based and not about understanding or about what is stopping people from changing. And in order to do that, that's where you need the dialogue. dialogue. You need to understand what it is that would help people to change and we don't know whether you know to what extent it's lack of information and lack of understanding there may be financial constraints um for example retrofitting your house or it may just be impractical you know there's no public transport you've got to get into your car but you know we have to understand that and to be able to feed that back into the sort of broader plans um and I, it's just that you know, just sending out messages that people have to do things is, is not going to have the right effect. It's got to be a two-way dialogue here. And then I'll be, you know, question is why a citizens and jury and not an assembly? Um, next door at Adrian Worthing District Council, they're running an online assembly at the moment with 40 participants. And uh, based on our district's relative population, the uh, um, number of participants that we should be having if, if Adrian Worthing have 40, um, we have a smaller population in our district, so it would be 27 participants. And I think there's a sense we're being sold, sold short there and that this takes a lot of setting up and organizing. So you might as well um, do it properly and have a climate as, uh, citizens assembly. Um, Tom, do you want to just wrap up? Yes, I thought I'd just use this metaphor uh, this is one of the um, stones that Andrew Goldsworthy put into our um, into our local environment, and they've been slowly decaying away. And I sort of feel it, we've got to get from from that to a chess piece, and we've really just got to get on with it. And we we shouldn't really spend too much time messing about with finessing a plan. We really just have to get on with it, and um, yeah, make that beautiful chess piece.